Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In today's video, I'm going to continue my um, uh, several series discussion on um, introductory methods to understanding qualitative research. Um, in the last video, in the last series of videos, what I did was, in the last 10 videos, I went through and I gave an account of um, sort of how narrative research unfolds within the context of qualitative research methods. In this section of the video, and this is going to be section 2.1, in this section of the series rather, what I'm going to be doing is shifting the focus of the analysis from narrative research to phenomenological research. I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about what phenomenology is, what um, the purpose and the goals, the intended outcomes of phenomenological research are, um, and give you, as I did with narrative research, many, many examples of implementing phenomenolo phenomenological research in whatever qualitative research program that you, uh, you might be interested in doing. Uh, with that being said, uh, let's begin the analysis. Okay, so this is introduction. This is introduction to methods of qualitative research. All right, so this is the introduction to uh, methods of qualitative research. It's coming from section 2.1 in the notes. Um, as I've said before, the notes are available to you. The banner will pop up. Click the banner. It'll take you to the PDF. Or go in the, the link in the description field. Click that. It'll take you to the PDF. You can follow along, print along, um, and we will continue. So this is section 2.1. Or, yeah, 2.1. 2.1. Alright, um, and this is phenomenological research. Alright, so um, let's begin with a definition of phenomenological research. Um, this definition uh, and much of the analysis is coming from um, the second edition of uh, John W. Creswell's Qualitative Inquiry and Research Design, Choosing Among Five Approaches. This is the uh, SAGE publication, so this is what I'm using to, uh, as my main source of reference for the various types of qualitative research. I'm um, sort of uh, adding that with, uh, when I do participatory action research, I'll use uh, Alice uh, McIntyre's participatory action research. Um, I'm also using, where's the other books? Uh, where did I put the other books? I'm also using Yin for uh, case study. I'm using, and so on and so on and so forth. I don't have all the books here to show you. There's some written, probably still in my back, but um, I'm using Creswell as the main text and then um, other specialists in each particular field to um, subsidize or, or, or buttress the, uh, the, uh, the content information. All right, um, so definition of um, phenomenological research. Quote, whereas narrative study reports the life of a single individual, a phenomenological study describes the meaning of several individuals of their lived experience, right? So it's a descriptive account. It's a descriptive account of a person's lived experience, but unlike a narrative account, we can talk about several individuals, right? We can talk about the phenomenological, um, applying a phenomenological study to the lived experience of multiple people. I know that's extremely vague, extremely general now. Again, as I said in previous videos, this series, these videos that I'll be doing on introductory methods to phenomenology, to uh, qualitative research um, is, is that. It's an introductory. I use this specifically to supplement um, my teaching. You might use it to supplement your teaching if you're an educator, or you might use it to uh, supplement your education, right, or to get ideas for good research topics. Um, with respect to an analysis of phenomenolo phenomenology in general, I'll, I'll get a little bit more, uh, progressively more uh, um, detailed as we continue the analysis. All right, um, so we recognize that, like, it, there is some similarity with narrative research because it is going to be a descriptive account, in a, in a sense. Um, that descriptive account, unlike narrative research, usually has a higher end, right? There's typically more people that participate, not necessarily the case, but there's typically more people that participate um, that you need as participants in a phenomenological study than in a narrative study. You can do a very good narrative study with one or two people phenomenological study, 
you might need, uh, and you're probably going to need um, uh, substantially more than one or two people. But that's not really what defines phenomenological research. That's sort of just a very general overview of what phenomenological research uh, is. There are five elements um, to um, phenomenological research. They're not, in any sense, exhaustive. There might be more than five. There probably are more than five. Creswell presents five. I'm going to present five. Um, so, five elements of phenomenological research. First element. Um, the first thing is the identification of a shared experience, and this is this is essential, right? This is really the beginning, the sort of the basis of phenomenological research, right? The identification of shared experience, right? The identification of a shared experience. And the question is, why is it important that the experience be shared? In a second, we'll see the, uh, the relevance of having the experience shared. Um, in phenomenology, when we're talking about phenomenology, it really is about the lived individual experience of the person. However, unlike a narrative where sort of the research would culminate in that lived experience of the individual, what, phenomenolo what phenomenological research does that narrative research doesn't do is that it tries to extrapolate to some universal form um, with respect to that experience, right? So what we're really interested in is the shared experience. My, my experience of something, Mary's experience of the same thing, and then I can do sort of a comparative and contrasting account of my experience versus um, Mary's experience. But also what I can do is, and also what I should recognize immediately, is that I have a fuller understanding of the experience the more participants I have describing the nature of that experience, right? The more participants that say, yeah, my experience of this was dot, 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 then I have a fuller understanding of what that experience must be like as such, in a, in a sense, right? Um, so the first sort of little caveat is to recognize that a phenomenological study um, is going to approach or approximate a universal claim, but it in no sense can make a universal claim, right? It would be fallacious at the conclusion of your phenomenological study to say, because Bob experienced this phenomena in this manner, all people experience this phenomena in this manner. That would be, I mean, that's sort of obvious, right? It's, it's, it's ridiculous to even mention it. Um, the point is, however, the more people, Bob, Mary, Tim, you know, Tina, Fred, blah, 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 all these people have an account of an experience, and that account, in some sense, there are elements of their accounts that all address the same aspect or property of that experience, then we know that there's something about that experience um, which arguably suggests a universal nature that individuals have with respect to that experience. This is what phenomenology does when it's done properly, right? What we're trying to do is we're trying to have an understanding of some, in a very loose sense, universal form by the lived experience of individuals who have experienced that event, right? Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll get a little bit more in detail in a second. So identification of the shared experience. Number two is phenomenological research attempts to locate the universal nature of an experience. This, this is what I was saying, right? Um, there is an attempt to understand what an experience is, not necessarily as such, but what an experience is for the most part, right? So, for example, part of my, um, my and I've talked a little bit about my dissertation that, that I wrote when I was a graduate student, part of my dissertation incorporated aspects of phenomenological research. Um, I wanted to know what the lived experience of Holocaust survivors were during that era and how they experienced the Holocaust, right? Um, the vast majority of them were in camps. I had a few that weren't in camps. For those that were in camps, they all had relatively um, the similar experiences. They, there were some things that there were disagreements on, but you could, you could extrapolate from um, sort of the collective accounts of their individual experience some sense in which the... Um, you could talk about the, the experience of the Holocaust. That's what I thought initially. And my phenomenological research guided my, my research. What I didn't realize 
is that despite all of their accounts and despite the similarity and redundancies in their accounts, the one thing that they also all said, and I've said this in previous videos, my video on narrative um, research, I, I discussed this a little bit, is that no matter how much they convey the atrocities, I, as a person who didn't experience that, that phenomenon, would never really have a true understanding of the experience. And I didn't anticipate that initially in my research. I thought I would have a full understanding, but I, you know, I came to find out that I didn't have an understanding. I don't think my research was any better or worse for not having an understanding. I think what happened is that that was one of the outcomes of my research. 